Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming. Thank you for joining us. We are very excited to announce the opening of a critical review of orofacial myofunctional therapy and sleep disordered breathing. We'll discuss phenotyping, clinical markers, and early intervention. <clears throat> to get us started this afternoon, I'd like to introduce Mark Moeller, who is currently the executive director of the Academy of Applied Myofunctional Sciences and the managing director of the Academy of Orofacial Myofunctional Therapy. We're indeed honored to be here together to do this important work to discuss the emergence of this very important critical field. So without further ado, thank you, Mark. Thank you, uh, Sharon. Uh, it's sort of a real privilege to be here today on uh, this august occasion uh, amongst such esteemed uh, scientists. Sorry. Um, let me take the microphone. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. So, uh, just so you know, uh, we are live streaming here, uh, so this will be filming. This presentation will be recorded, and uh, it'll be seen around the world. Uh, so, speakers, I will help you uh, prepare this for your lapel. Um, it's a supplemental microphone uh, for uh, the video recording. Uh, so, uh, why myofunctional therapy and sleep disorder breathing? I'm going to touch on that. Just a couple disclosures. Um, when you breathe, air travels down your throat, through your windpipe, and into your lungs. The narrowest part of that pathway is in the back of your throat. When you're awake, muscles keep that pathway relatively wide open. But when you sleep, those muscles relax, allowing the opening to narrow. The air passing through this narrowed opening may cause the throat to vibrate. So this particular juncture uh, is, is what we're talking about when we're talking about apnea. And uh, really, uh, the current literature, the standards of care, really, you know, to address obstructive sleep apnea, which affects over a billion people around the world, uh, according to the American Thoracic Society, is not really explored in the current standards. So this is, you know, every real protocol, this is for sleep surgery from the European Respiratory Society does not talk about looking where the tongue posture is in the mouth, whether someone is awake or asleep. Certainly the Boston group and uh, some of their uh, uh, satellites that have sprung out around the world, uh, Adelaide, Sydney, Melbourne, um, are looking at the phenotypes involved and also in Paris, but uh, Really, you know, the standard questionnaires, the standards of care, Stop Bang, PSQ, uh, Berlin, are not looking at whether or not someone's mouth breathing or uh, whether or not someone's tongue posture is, is on the floor of the mouth. And so this uh, low tongue posture is what we're talking about in terms of myofunctional therapy. Uh, today, we're gonna bring you a cross-section of scientists presenting cutting edge research that I think uh, should be exciting for this audience here today, as well as we'll have some clinicians, uh, we'll have some people talking about public health projects, we'll be talking about emerging science, and we'll be talking a little bit about the history of medicine. But when we're talking about sleep apnea, and uh, this paper from uh, Doug McAvoy, which I think you're all familiar with, we're talking about the gold standard, still the standard of care being CPAP, it being really uh, not uh, so effective when you talk about cardiac uh, or cardiovascular events. So malfunctional therapy, what is it? We're talking about re-education of the oral rest posture of the tongue, chewing, breathing, and swallowing. So these are functional patterns and rest postures, like lip seal. This was originally envisioned, and, and this uh, terminology first made it into the literature 101 years ago. And it came out of the orthodontic imagination. Uh, Dr. Alfred Paul Rogers, who is credited with being one of the pioneering orthodontists, and uh, his group at Harvard 
first came up with this. And he fought really for his career to champion the concept that soft tissue was always going to trump bone. And I think uh, orthodontics went a little bit of a different direction in its infancy. And when you look at orthodontics today, there is so much great new literature coming out. And uh, the next speaker, uh, Dr. Takashi Ono, will present, I think, some, some interesting uh, research that uh, I hope will have an impact. So who does myofunctional therapy? It's uh, an emerging area of medicine. So when we, uh, the title of this lecture or this symposium, uh, a critical review, we want to be conscious of the fact that this is an emerging area of medicine. It's not a field, it's not a profession. It effectively functions as a subspecialty of other professions that might have it in their scope of practice to work in this area. This could be a physical therapist, such as in France, where physical therapists uh, or kinesiotherapists lead this, or in Hong Kong, it could be physical therapists, speech pathologists, dental hygienists. The field, uh, as it's emerging, could be dominated by speech pathologists, such as in Brazil, or in Japan, dental hygienists. In the United States, we could have ENTs, certainly general dentists, specialty dentists, um, even nurse practitioners. And really fundamentally, we need to think about it, not term in terms of muscle training, in terms of strengthening, but really uh, it's neurological re-education. And uh, this is an image uh, from uh, some work that uh, uh, some colleagues are doing, have done in Paris. Um, if you look at the uh, first image, this is a brain of an eight-year-old at rest. And uh, this is uh, an image of this eight-year-old swallowing. And you can see this little area light up. And this image on the right is while doing a myofunctional therapy exercise. Um, so when we have, uh, this is a 35-year-old uh, with a group from Belgium looking at this. Um, sorry, if I could just go back. Uh, this is uh, the brain at rest. Um, this is uh, doing myofunctional therapy exercise. And then one, one month later, doing myofunctional therapy, uh, this image is lit up even stronger. Um, and uh, on the uh, right here, you can see uh, this is just the brain at rest. You can see there's effectively been a, a new neural pathway created. So that's what we're talking about, this establishment of a new neural pathway. So we have exercises that someone can perform, and someone, by bringing the tongue up to the palate and drawing it back, with, with, which uh, this exercise will have to do, in order to bring the weighted string up and rotating the mandible forward, this is going to be creating a new functional pattern in creating a new neural pathway. So when you have the patient do it. Um, Look at him go, how many does he have on there, Mom? <laughs> they're gonna have a, an opportunity uh, to create new imprints. And we'll organize exercises into sequences, send them home, they'll be doing exercises typically a few times a day. And uh, there's s some stability that starts to take place after about 100 days. But the follow-up with the patient might uh, take up to a year to two years to make sure these changes are stable. And this is always working within an allied health team. Could involve surgery, could involve orthodontics, could involve certainly sleep specialists. So we have this umbrella term of uh, clinical markers, phenotypes, and syndromes that we call orofacial myofunctional disorders that fall under this. So when we have, uh, we can see from this group uh, in Rio de Janeiro did the study. The image on the left here is a composite uh, airway of about 25 subjects uh, of, of uh, mouth breathers. And the airway on the right is a composite of nasal breathers. You can see there is a, a more robust, more established airway. So this, this area that we're talking about in, in the human anatomy is uh, really you know, somewhat vulnerable uh, for us as a species. And uh, this is some great work. There's a team in the University of Umea in Sweden, Farhan Shah, 
and they're talking about the stomatothic system and the pharyngeal wall. And we can see uh, this floating system, really, that's anchored to the hyoid bone is vulnerable based on where the tongue posture rests. So you can see, uh, this is from uh, some work done at Stanford. You can see this myofunctional therapy exercise actually tightening the pharyngeal wall. So by doing these kind of exercises, you know, we can see uh, this effect and this has a way of creating uh, a patency in the airway. So uh, we have papers, we have emerging literature. Uh, this paper, uh, which was a landmark study in 2009, a small group of patients, uh, but uh, really it came out and it was in the top 10 of most cited uh, papers in the sleep literature in its first three years. And you can see here, uh, we see this in study after study. Uh, this is a control group, the therapy group, had a severe reduction in AHI that was stable, as well as an increase in oxygen saturation. And uh, they showed in this study a decrease in neck circumference. This meta-analysis uh, published in Sleep four years ago uh, demonstrated, uh, and this is based on literature from studies eight years old, 10 years old. We get better results than this now. And uh, we have a lot of exciting research in the pipeline. Uh, so uh, reduction in AHI collectively in the adult population by 50% with stability over time, and in children by 62%. So we show great promise in early intervention. We also show strength in, in addressing snoring. This is another meta-analysis on snoring. And uh, this is from Sergio Tufek's team in Brazil, in Sao Paulo, showing efficacy in making CPAP more effective, increasing uh, patient acceptance, comfort, and lowering of AHI amongst CPAP users as well. So we have emerging standards of care, textbook chapters. There are more going in the newer editions of uh, Principles and Practice. We have statements from the Ministry of Health in Italy, uh, the French Sleep Research Society, Asian Pediatric Pulmonology Society, all calling for updates to their standards of care and updating their standards of care. This is a recent one from the German Sleep Society. Uh, you'll hear from someone who's helping lead a task force with the American Dental Association later today. Uh, so there's uh, great little steps taking place all over the world. Uh, just recently, the Japanese government start, added it to their health system to pay for it. So, um, but really, we're still on the frontier. So I hope you'll come away from this symposium today uh, feeling that we can move beyond the campfire. You'll leave this campfire of being on the frontier, take something back to your institutions, to your home countries, to your clinics, and say, there's something to this. So even though we don't have a profession yet, we need to have standards of care around the world. We need to have much more science, but we're working on this with a great sense of urgency. Uh, we just established yesterday an international sleep uh, research network that will focus on myofunctional therapy. And we have great centers around the world. So uh, thank you very much, and uh, I hope uh, to be a resource for you in the future.